we're just going to give folks uh, probably about two more minutes. No problem. To join. You need some elevator music. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Okay, one more minute and then we will begin. Good afternoon, Christopher James. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like that smiley face. Okay, we're going to begin. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Janine Gilbert and I am the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer as well as the Chief MWBE Officer here at OTI. Now, in honor of Women's History Month it, and as a continuation of our Women Women's History Month speaker series, I'm thrilled to welcome Lisa Galobter. Lisa Galopter is the, is the CEO and founder of Techwitable, um, which uses technology to make workplaces more equitable. Techwitable provides an independent, confidential platform to, add, to address issues of bias and discrimination. With 25 years plus, 25 plus years in the industry and products that have been used by billions of people, Lisa has worked on several pioneering internet technologies, including Shockwave, Hulu, and the ascent of online video. Lisa Galobter brings consumer focus and transformative practice to bear in technology, media, and the social sector. Uh, Lisa's experience ranges from small entrepreneurial startups to large established organizations, and she has an extensive background in digital strategy, business operations, and product development. Lisa is actively working to make the world a better, more inclusive place and serves on the board or steering committees of Obama's found Obama Foundation's Digital Council, Time's Up Tech, uh, Dev Color, and the Education Trust. Lisa has been named one of Inc. Magazine's 100 Women Building America's Most Innovative and Ambitious Businesses. Fast Company's Most Creative People and is spotlighted in Eric Reese's book, The Startup Way. Lisa is one of the first 40 black women ever to have raised over 1 million in venture capital funding. She is also proud to be a black woman with a degree in computer science. Go STEM, go Lisa, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much, quite the introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, so, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your career path and how you got to where you are today? Yes, that's a very, very broad. It's question. very broad, very broad. Yes. Uh, I just career wise, um, 
uh, I will, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. So I, I do have a degree in computer science. I'm a black woman with a degree in computer science, which unfortunately makes me somewhat of a unicorn, which makes me cry pretty much every day. Uh, I will say, and I actually just mentioned this to you, which is uh, my, my course to getting that degree was not your your typical one necessarily so it did take me 24 years to graduate from college but i got it done uh but in the meanwhile i've been working in tech for actually over 30 years now and uh and been fortunate enough to work on some pretty transformative technologies so uh, I was a software engineer on something called Shockwave, which in the 90s basically made the web move and introduced animation, multimedia, interactivity to the web uh, and really changed people's expectations and interactions and how they could actually use the web. Uh, I also helped launch Hulu, uh, where, again, changing what people expected were the norms for video and, again, it, interactions and expectations. Uh, you'll see kind of it's been, I've been at the bleeding edge, everything that has to do with kind of video, media, technology, and the internet, kind of from that inception. Um, I ran digital at BET, Black Entertainment Television, the television network for Viacom. Uh, and then I went to work at the White House under President Obama, where I was the chief digital service officer for the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and for me, it was really there that I kind of really came to internalize just how much we could harness technology to solve what had been previously thought of as intractable problems, right? How do you make systemic level change? How do you make societal level change? Uh, and as I was leaving the administration, trying to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up, because it is a journey, I was like, look, if we can send a Tesla Roadster into outer space and create space debris, Right. This is not rocket science. We can use some of those same best practices, product development approaches, innovative strategies right here on our home planet to solve some of the issues for the underserved, the underrepresented and the underestimated. And so that is how Techwitable came to be. And so I am the CEO and founder of a company called Techwitable, as you said, using technology to make workplaces more equitable. And our mission is to really help companies and organizations create work culture that's gonna work for everyone. Uh, and so that is launched me into the startup land of it all. I mean, it worked at startups before, uh, but now this was my very own. Uh, and I'm just really, really proud of the work that we're doing and the change that we're making. And so trying to really provide a sounding board for employees where they can come, explore their options, uh, get advice, figure out what their action plan should be if they're having interpersonal conflict or microaggressions or micro inequities, but kind of across the board. So things like, you know, I joined a Zoom call with 20 other people on it, and my manager didn't see me, and I heard them talking about me, right? So kind of across the board, but helping employees sort out what they can do about that stuff. And then flip side is uh, an, uh, collecting data, anonymized and aggregated, uh, and trying to identify systemic issues within an organization's culture so we can create a report for the management team to try to get in front of some of those issues because we really want to work on both sides of the equation because solving these issues really does take systemic change, trying to create this virtuous cycle. So empowering and supporting employees and helping organizations uh, get in front of the issues before they escalate. So that is my journey. <laughs> that is a very jam-packed journey over the last, uh, I guess, 30 years. Um, so, uh, as you know, we are New York City's tech agency, and, and we always like to know when our guests have a connection to New York. So, do you have a connection to New York? Uh, so, absolutely. So, I am a born and raised New Yorker. Uh, I lived there, went to school there, all of those things. I did leave for... I mean, all told, this is what happens when you get old. I, for about 20 years, I left for uh, 15, uh, oh no, for 20, came back for 20, left again. Uh, and now I split my time between Oakland and New York. Um, but also my brother worked in the Dinkins administration uh, as director of the environment of New York. Uh, both of my parents were district leaders in New York City. So uh, deep, deep ties to uh, government uh, in New York City. And I imagine that some of your love of education stemmed from your experience in New York. I think uh, 
education was really about more than that. It's about trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and create pathways for folks who, um, who don't necessarily have access. Right. So one of the things that we worked on with college scorecard is this idea of, um, getting information into the hands so people can make informed choices right so the department of education can't say this is a good school versus that is a bad school right how do you compare uh an hbcu right historically black college university like howard to a harvard they serve very different peoples how do you how do you compare a, a divinity school or berkeley school of music to an mit right it's not that one is better than the other they are just different and so part of what it is was about is actually getting the right information at the right time into the hands of the people who were, who needed to help that help to make the right choices for themselves. So that's, that's the driver for me about what education can do and bring. Um, I think I'm, I, uh, the other thing for me is I'm a big believer in, even though it took me 24 years to get a college degree, I am a big believer in, um, in getting a college education, especially for black, brown and black folks. Um, at least when, uh, I was in the, in the, in, in the Obama administration, the stats were such that a degree from a four-year granting institution was worth more, oh, more than a million dollars over the course of your lifetime. And so there's all of these reasons. And so for me, it was more about equity. Uh, and and that's part of why I'm uh, on the board of uh, Education Trust, because uh, again, they're about trying to make education more equitable for everybody. So those are, those are the things that drive me as opposed to uh, pedagogy, if that makes sense. Yes, indeed. And in fact, I actually want to touch on that again later, but for right now, you, you mentioned that it took you 24 years to get a college degree. Um, what is your degree in and um, why did it take so long? What was what what made you leave and what made you come back? Yeah, uh, so I come from a low income background. Uh, I was a Pell Grant recipient, uh, which is just a way to explain what my financial situation was. And uh, and it turns out going to college and working 40 hours a week is real hard. Uh, so I did two years. I had to drop out for financial reasons. <clears throat> um, I went back for three and a half, did another two years, still didn't graduate, uh, moved to California so I could start working as a software engineer, but continued to take classes at San Francisco State, at San Jose State. Uh, it took me 15 years to write a paper. Uh, but uh, so and I studied so computer science with a with a with a, um, a concentration in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, that page, that five page paper that I owed was actually about uh, about machine learning. It was a Lego robots class uh, and how uh, how I taught it to to find find the light. Um, so that was my journey but yeah it is um oh and i do believe that everybody i see there's all kinds of programs that are cs for all like bringing cs into elementary schools and i just think that that is also so critical because in this day and age these skills the skills that you learn doing software development uh is are things that you are going to take with you for for whatever career you do but also tech now exists in every field in every industry and you can see that through what i have done right i like my fields have changed but my skills have grown but they're they're based in in computer science and so for me there's something about also this idea of people saying well i'm not going to be a software engineer i don't need to learn to code but people don't say well, like i'm not going to be a novelist i don't need to learn to write right those are not those, that's not the same math and the skills that you learn are like persistence right because you're never like debugging and learning how to think logically and then also the way we teach computers now really has to do with empathy because you really have to put yourself in the shoes of the user and so and thinking about how to interrogate and ask questions and so there's all of these skills that kind of come through it uh which i think are so important that was 100 percent not your question um oh. but i thought i got on my little soapbox for a minute Hey, I'm all for the soapbox. Um, so, well, you talked about being in computer science with a concentration in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And I'm curious whether there were many women or black women in your field. And if not, because I'm guessing not, um, how did you navigate that? Who were your role models? Who were your mentors? How did you, how did you succeed in that environment? Yeah, so this is a question I get asked a lot, 
typically, which is who are your mentors, whether it was in college or through your career, throughout your career. And again, because when I, I basically came into tech and started working in tech at the time when things were pivoting, when basically the consumers, regular people were being exposed to the internet, right? So in the early, early to mid nineties. Uh, and so it was really kind of a transitional year. So there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of stuff that came before because everything was so new. Um, and there were very few black folks, very few women and almost no black women. Um, and so I always say, I didn't have any mentors in the way that we think about them now, but what I did have was I had peers who believed in me more than I believed in myself and who were always, always, and they continue to do that to this day, push me forward, push me into, into opportunities and circumstances that I am not 100% sure that I'm ready for. Um, but so far they've been right. Um, and I will say, so if I had graduated from Brown on time in 91, uh, I think I would have been the ninth black woman to to uh, to graduate from Brown with a degree in computer science. Um, so there were not a lot of us, but there were people who it mattered to. So I think part of the reason I ended up gravitating towards machine learning and artificial intelligence is that my the professor who kind of managed that concentration was a woman. Uh, and so I think that was actually probably a big part of it for me. I don't know if it was conscious or, or not, but um, there's another professor, Andy Van Dam, who's been there for 50 years. And he actually, he actually has gotten a bunch of awards around, he's also a serious computer scientist, but uh, he's written books on, on computer graphics, but, um, but specifically about uh, the undergraduate TA program, teaching assistant program, and how he brings people in and makes it fun. Like if you take a computer class, depending on the class, like it's hard work, but it's, it's like there were skits in our classes. Um, and, and so he would specifically go out for his undergraduate uh, teaching assistants and make sure to recruit folks. It was 50, 50 men and women, which right, given the class, that's not that easy. <laughs> um, and also diversity from a race and ethnicity perspective. And, um, and he's another one who pushed us beyond what we thought. He basically had undergraduates helping him write books on, I think it was on, on C++ and on Java and object-oriented uh, programming and stuff like that. We're, we're like, we're like sophomores and juniors in college. And the responsibility that he put on us because he believed in us uh, was really pretty remarkable. And I think and again, he gave me opportunities. So when I had to leave school because I couldn't afford it, he still let me if I can say this, because uh, it's against university policy. But he actually let me be uh, a teaching assistant, even though I was no longer in college, because I needed. Oh wow! Um, so and so, yeah, he was uh, he was the biggest. He was the fiercest, strongest hugs, and he was the first person to give me a hug after I finally graduated. He was like, "I never thought you'd get here." So, <laughs> um, but so it's those kinds of. It's like it's the little it's the little angels who who see something in you and and put and push you and, and spark things so oh well, and, it sounds like... sorry same thing, same thing leslie kelbling that other professor she uh she got a grant from nsf so that i could study with her over the summer because again i like everything for me related to like i needed to find a job and so i helped her put together a, a machine learning class so and it was because like because she found the grant money so that i could be paid was what set that stuff up but it's really those people who are looking out for you um who are who are who are the the kind of sitting on your shoulders helping out well it sounds like you had some very powerful angels on your shoulders um but how was it being a woman entering the field um when you did um obviously and without a college degree at that time uh how was it how do you think being a woman impacted your opportunities, if at all, um, either, you know, in terms of being a benefit or a detraction. I, I'm curious what your experience was early on. Yeah, I just for the record, it is still impacting my opportunities. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I don't, um, I, I, I love being a black woman, but I don't know that it is helpful uh, in the field that I'm in. I know, you know, I've, I've never necessarily seen benefits from it. Um, 
it's tough. I, so I will say, um, you know, and I've had this conversation with every person who graduated from Brown in computer science from like 1987 to 1997, uh, which is we all feel like we don't belong, right? You walk into this classroom, which is 80% men, and they're all in front of their computers, and they're like laughing and engaging, and they're playing the video games. I don't play video games. I don't. Uh, I'm a very good software engineer, but I don't. I, 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 you know, I don't program on the on the side. I don't. I don't have that kind of engagement with it. I'm not passionate about it like that. And it is tough to feel like, oh. Oh, maybe maybe I don't belong here. Maybe this isn't for me because I don't look like them, feel like them, engage like them. And so, uh, one of the things that I say is actually, I think that's your superpower. It's your unique perspective, right? If everybody was homogenous and everybody, sorry, a bird just flew by. <laughs> um, if everybody was homogenous uh, and you know thought the same way and same approach, we wouldn't have different perspectives to bring to the table. And so, uh, which again, all the research shows is actually cre creates a better product. Uh, and so that's actually your superpower. So embracing it. But I will say it continues to be tough. It's tough to be, I mean, I go to, Again, this is not just an early career, uh, just in corporate, right? Like, so I was mm -hmm. essentially the chief uh, uh, digital officer or chief technology officer for digital at BET. And I would go into meetings with vendors who were trying to sell us tech. And they would talk to somebody who worked for me, who was a guy, I, I guess, because he was a guy. And I was like, I don't, mm -hmm. you are not getting our contract. It gets a very... Um, <laughs> One of my favorite stories is, um, so I worked on uh, on Shockwave Flash, right? Animation video on the web. Um, I was years later working at a company that was using Flash to do video on the web. And I was in, uh, I, I was I was operations at that time. Um, and so I was sitting in with the CTO and a team of engineers, and they were talking about what platform they should move to from a video perspective. And apparently after the meet, and they were they were exploring Flash, which is why the CTO invited me into the meeting. Um, apparently afterwards, one of the lead engineers said to the CTO, wow, I'm really impressed that Lisa was able to follow along for that whole hour and a half meeting. I invented the technology where we're, I mean, again, not me, a team, but I'm like, what? So it's those are the kinds of things that you have to deal with. I will also say, you know, it's stuff like uh, what you often hear from, from engineers, from women engineers is, oh, people always assume that I'm the product manager or that I'm in marketing or I'm the designer. Uh, I have been mistaken for the administrative assistant at every organization I've worked at, except for this one, except for my own. Um, for and again, I've been a VP for twenty plus years. Like I've been, you know, I don't always wear suits, but I dress pretty professionally. Um, and so, so that's so black women engineers and actually apparently Latin Latinx as well are often mistaken for administrative staff, for delivery okay. people, for uh, for janitor janitorial staff. So uh, there's 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 kind of layers to being a woman engineer. Well, so it sounds like you faced a lot of obstacles. Um, I'm curious how you would advise, because as you know, we are a tech agency, and so our staff are techies, or at least most of them are. Um, and I'm curious how you would advise those staff members or folks in this industry, because this is streaming, um, how would you advise them to navigate those obstacles in order to succeed? Yeah. So a question I get asked a lot by uh, engineers, black and brown engineers typically is, well, how do I, how do I convince or, uh, or explain to my organization that diversity inclusion is really important? <clears throat> and my answer to them is always, you don't. That's not your job. Your job is to get the work that you're getting paid to do done so that you can be successful at it, so that you can get promoted, so you can bring other people who look like you along. And so it really is about, <clears throat> about trying to figure out what's going to work for you. 
um, and what you and 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 again how to make it work for you, and so that you can focus on the things that uh, again you are going to get recognized or dinged for, um, and that's I think the most critical thing to be looking at. I will also say, I mean, there's also egregious stuff that happens, and sometimes you just <clears throat> you can't, right? It's not it's not a I guess what I would suggest is trying to look for work environments that are going to be supportive, that are going to be welcoming, that are going to be inclusive, right? What do they say that um, uh, it's diversity is being invited to the dance, inclusion is being asked to dance, but belonging is knowing the songs, right? It's like, so it's that level. And so I think that to me is in the last 10 years or so, I've essentially, well, actually more than that, probably BET. So I went to, part of the reason I went to BET was at that time I'd been working in tech for 20 years and I had never had either a black person or a woman anywhere in the chain above me. Uh, and at the time, uh, Deborah Lee was the CEO of BET, CEO and chairman of BET. Uh, and so that was a big part of the reason I went there. And so since uh, between that, right, which is, I don't know, BET is like 70 or 80% black, and there's nothing like walking into the, uh, the control room of the television network and having it being filled with black folks like it's just it's just such a great feeling um knowing that we can it's a it's right it's um there's somebody mitch kapoor who's one of our investors who says uh genius is equally distributed by zip code but opportunity is not right mm -hmm. and so the fact that we haven't been able uh to be to have given the the opportunities right and so rather than minorities using the term like historically excluded right it's not fault of our own uh and so just seeing what that can look like and experiencing that in a different environment was really wonderful for me and then going into the obama administration frankly it felt like that there too i'm not the numbers were not the same <clears throat> but you know but again uh the secretary of ed ended up being a black man the uh, deputy secretary and of med was a black man the cio uh of ed was a black man the cto of fsa the head of federal student aid was a black man so um anyway so so and since then i have consciously crafted the community with which I choose to engage. And so I think that's the other thing in terms of advice is if you're not getting it in the workplace, make sure you are finding the community that you need to support you, um, whatever, whatever that looks like. So I think, I think that's the other thing that was really important for me. So for those who are not able to leave to find the place where they feel like they are belonging, where they know the song, um, how would you advise them inside the organization where they may not be asked to dance? They may not know the song. How do they get to a place where they can succeed in that environment? Uh, <clears throat> so I do think the idea of finding community. So people, when something happens to you, you can go and talk to them. Uh, that could be equitable, for example, but uh, friends or peers uh, in different departments and different organizations who at least you don't have to like explain, oh, I think that might have been racist or I felt some kind of way about that, right? That you could just say and be who you are. I think finding that no matter what is really important. Uh, and that can, that can be outside of your company too, just making sure you have that support. I think internally, I think there's figuring out what's going to make you successful within an organization. Different organizations all have different cultures about what communication works best, right? So for example, at a tech company, typically um, what you'll get is it doesn't really matter whose idea it was, if you can make the case, if you can make the argument, oh gosh, learning to make a business case as an engineer was one of the things that served me the most, right? So I not, I gotta be able to articulate why I think that's the right answer, why that's so important. Um, but being able to do that and figure out how to do it for your organization. But I was in another organization where it depended on who said it. So it had to come from the CEO or the COO in order for something to actually happen, uh, which is a little bit tragic. Uh, but figuring out how to, how to work within whatever system you're in, I think is really important. Um, and then the other thing is you mentioned mentors. Uh, and then there's, of course, the concept of sponsors and just for elaboration. Sponsors, yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so the distinction. Yes, please elaborate for oh, no, folks what? here. How about you? You're, you're the chief diversity and inclusion. No, no, you go ahead. I'm, I, that is sponsorship <laughs> and mentorship. People don't understand. Yes. So go ahead. 
Yeah. So mentors are somebody essentially who's coaching you, you're working with, you have a relationship, there's intentionality. There's sponsors are folks who will promote you and talk about you when you are not in the room um, and and who are of in, in positions of power and positions of influence and who basically right are your are your hype folks when you don't even necessarily know about it. Uh, and so um, and here's the other thing. People are always looking for folks who look like them or who they can relate to. I will say for me, there's also, you could, first of all, you can learn from everybody. Like there are definitely folks who've either been, you know, uh, higher up in the hierarchy or chain than me, people who have worked for me where I was like, ooh, I love how you communicate, how you actually are so forthright, but in a way that is not putting people off. Ooh, how can I do some of that? Like I, I'm always looking to like take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that from everybody that I meet. Um, but sponsor specifically, right? It is, I will also say the flip side of it, it is, it is folks who are in position of power should use their powers for good intentionally, right? That idea of how do you lift people up? How do you bring people along? How do you put forth names and voices that are not typically heard? Um, and also, again, the idea of looking for people who they don't necessarily have to look like you or feel like you, but who have been successful in the organization and, and trying to understand what works for them, what has been working for them so that you can take from that what you want, right? You still want to be authentic to you. I'm not saying like you have to be somebody else. Um, but if you are, again, this is all about making informed choices, right? The, if you can actually figure out what works here and then decide whether that is something that feels true to you or not. So, well, that's a wonderful lesson. Um, now, I'm. you also mentioned going to the place or finding the place where you do feel included and feel as though you belong. Now, in your specific area where it seems like you were working on artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, creating flash and video and shockwaves, and I'm not a techie in case you <laughs> can't get that. Um, how did you... Um, first of all, what, what was your experience and what was going on with respect to that arena? Um, and then secondly, how did you find, or how did you find the opportunities to go to the places where you felt like you belonged? So I know that's a twofold question. One is, I'm curious about what was going on in that specific field with respect to artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of that stuff. And then how did you find the places to go to employ your knowledge in those arenas? Well, I will say artificial and machine, artificial intelligence and machine learning back in the, what is that, late 80s, early 90s was very different from what it is today, mm -hmm. especially what in the last six months, uh, a very different beast all, all in, I gotta say. Um, Right. At that point, it was really about uh, there's the Turing test, right, which is could you could you fool a human or could you even like win a chess game? Right. It was all it was we were at the I mean, this was I had an aha moment where it was like four o'clock in the morning. I was trying to do something with my little Lego robot and. And I was like, I was, again, I was having trouble having it learn. And I was like, somebody has to have figured this out. And there was my moment of like, oh, wait. No, nobody's actually figured this out. Like I could like I could invent a thing, which was a really cool experience because uh, I hadn't ever because, you know, in school, you're just kind of going through, especially I went to a French school. So it's very um, uh, they're basically like, you will learn this thing by heart and then you will say it. Right. Uh, right. It wasn't a whole lot of, uh, of in my mind, um, critical thinking. They might argue differently, but that was my experience with it. I was like, I, I can memorize that. No problem. Um, and so for me, it was really this first moment of like, oh, wait, this is a whole new world, a whole new field. And we really like nobody has the answers. Uh, again, AI and, and ML was very different. Oh, my God. Was that really 30 plus years ago? So um, so I don't want to I don't want to speak to those lessons necessarily because it's just such a different world now. Um, I will say one of the things that as you talked about like what was it like being 
you know, black and a woman in that space. I will also say when I look back at the friends that I have made, uh, I am, I, be, I, I befriended every black person and every woman uh, in, in, in the area, right, in that major um, or concentration. And, um, and to this day, those are still my best friends. Uh, there's also a, 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 a Latin guy um, who was actually my best friend, who, who basically he assumed I was Latina um, and started coming up to me and speaking to me in Spanish. Uh, and we are literally, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing him next week. Uh, and so, so that's what I say. You find your anchors, you find your support folks, you find people who, um, who, are, who, who, who you can go to, even though they're not in all of your classes and stuff like that. Um, how artificial intelligence and, and, and machine learning has, uh, has applied to kind of future work. Um, it's, it's been tough, right? So my main, my, I, I kind of, I, I moved into, or I happened into, I fell into, uh, the intersection of media and technology. Uh, so I didn't do that much, uh, AI and ML work, uh, in, in for uh, like 20 plus years of my career. Um, mm -hmm. and again, it's such a different beast now. So how did you find the opportunities though, to, to go to the places where you belonged doing the work that you wanted to do? Yes. So, um, so it's really funny because to me, there's a level of, oh, it looks like I had a, a, a career path that made sense. That was logical. That was intentional. And uh, it turns out in the day to day, it of course is not. Um, I will also say, and I just want to say this out loud too, which is, again, I often get questions about like, oh, tell me about your passion for computers and that kind of stuff. And I just want to be really clear. Like I am actually not passionate about computers. <laughs> I... I left college, I, again, low-income background, like, like I needed a J-O-B. When I left school, even without a college degree, I was making two times what my parents made combined. And so there is like, uh, barring anything else, and that is a reason to study computer science, uh, because it's going to, if you look at the, right, the wealth gap between black and brown, uh, black and white, like there's like, we have to start making uh, an affecting change there. And again, the, um, the opportunity, what there's something like 1.4 million unfilled uh, IT and tech jobs. Uh, and until we start including everybody in the innovation economy, uh, and those those um, those salaries actually pay more than your average uh, rates. And so there's a real opportunity there to, to change uh, the demographics of the industry uh, and make a real difference for our communities. Um, but beyond that, you were asking about how I was looking for jobs. So, so there was always economics. It was always like, well, how much am I going to make? Because that was, I support my family. It turns out it's an important thing. Um, and then also thinking about well, what am I going to learn? Um, what is the opportunity here? Is there something like interesting or, or that's going to spark my interest? And the thing that I always counsel people now is think about your next, next job. Like what are the three bullets that you're going to put on this job on your resume for the next job or that you want to learn? Um, so thinking about it that way. And then as I think about, I have definitely turned down jobs where uh, I didn't feel like the culture was right for me. Um, I was interviewed for a very high profile job recently, uh, well, within the last five years. Um, and I turned it down because, uh, the white man interviewing me basically talked down to me while, uh, interviewing me for a role that I was expert in. Like he was hiring me for my expertise and then like, was uh what's it like not, not pedantic but he just like uh, he i was like really uh and so i declined it turns out a year later he got fired because he was bullying all his female staff um mm. so but those are the things like your gut tells you i will also say just full disclosure i only feel like i've been able to make those choices in the last 10 years. Like I've been firm mm. in my commitment to what's important to me, but in the first 20 years of my career, I didn't have that luxury. I mean, so just real talk, right? Yes. 
I like I I can say it, but if I need a job, I need a job. And so, um, right. so you do your best, and then you try to insulate yourself, and you try to look for the right stuff. But you also, again, you got to figure out what you can tolerate, what you can handle, what you can thrive in. Right? It doesn't have to all be bad. Like where what's going to excite you? What's going to uh, to make everything like fall into place for you? Um, but then also sometimes, I'm not saying. Those are the choices that everybody has to make. Those are the choices that I had to make, uh, given my financial situations. But I am now, it's not so much that I'm actually in a better financial situation now that I have said that, but um, I now know what it can look like and can feel like. Uh, and that's one of the things that I credit actually working with BET for, uh, with like, oh, snap, it can be a different experience. So I was actually about to go back to BET. Glad you did. What exactly did you do for them? And what made you decide to move on to your next phase? Uh, okay. Uh, cause my next phase was the White House. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, what I did for BT, so I ran digital. So basically anything that wasn't on, done, didn't show up on your TV through cable, Kind of came through my department so actually vod came through my department uh the website the apps um uh yeah so all of the social media all of that stuff came through uh came through digital and so uh we actually did some really groundbreaking things at bt it was a little bit ahead of our time maybe uh we had the first um interactive live game show uh uh that, that again like you would do things like so they have a host and three com three competitors uh and so it was just really fantastic um we had another one 106 in park which uh, maybe you know it's a uh, it was it was live three days a week uh so it was um but there's a word for it um, that I'm drawing a blank on, like, I don't know, like a live show with an audience um, and right to play music videos and have interviews and stuff like that. And so one of them, and they had two hosts and well, for most of it, sometimes it had four, <laughs> um, but it ran for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we developed was actually uh, an interactive map. So when the show was live, uh, if you had the app on your phone open, the hosts would see a, a map of the US with dots with anybody who was in the app and they would zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, click, and you would be live on the air with them. So that idea of breaking the wall of moving from, from broadcast, right, which is one to many to actually like interaction and 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 uh and being able to be in the moment on live tv so we did some some fantastic uh stuff at uh at bet um that was great and then i got a call from the white house uh and to turn that one down huh <laughs> i was gonna say so there was there was a whole meeting um so president obama uh personally recruited about 12 of us because uh, he wanted to start this thing called the U.S. Digital Service. And um, and I will say, so after the meeting, somebody asked me, like, oh, are you going to do it? And I was like, I think when the president of the United States asked you to do something, the only answer is yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was a pretty incredible experience, both the recruiting process, because they don't actually tell you they're recruiting you. Uh, mm -hmm. I was invited down for a round table. Uh, and then they like make you, they literally, they like have you lock your cell phones outdoors. They bring you into room. I don't say they lock you in, they close the door behind you. So we were in the Roosevelt room, which I come to learn later is directly across from the Oval Office. It's basically uh, the president's conference room. Uh, and they're like, so I'll pretend to side, this is actually a recruiting trip. <laughs> and we were like, what is happening? So it was just, um, it was an incredible experience and then also being able to do great work um, and make change um, at the end of an administration that affected a lot of change. So it was really, um, there wasn't, I got, BET gave me a great send off. Uh, I will say it was also okay. when I was being recruited or when we had the, when we were at that round table, it was, it was, I thought it was adorbs. Um, and we all had our nameplates and what organizations we came from. And so it was like Red Hat and, you know, like Google and all of these things. And mine was like BET Networks. And I was like, that's so cute. <laughs> um, but because I'd worked in tech before too. So uh, it was just, um, yeah, 
and and here's the thing for me is that we made change we made change on the ground we affected real human lives the whole reason behind the digital service um is this idea of i can sit on my couch in new york and order a vegan burrito and mezcal and at this point probably weed and have it show up in 10 minutes <laughs> um, whereas if you want to file for SNAP benefits, right, food stamps, it takes months and months and it's really painful and really onerous. So how do we bring some of the stuff from private sector that we do so well into serving the government, uh, into serving the American people better? Mm -hmm. That was the whole concept. And so when you think of it that way and what we've been able to do and can you as the digital service, um, that it really is being able to affect people's lives and the people who who need it the most right who need the government services which is always a struggle um and so yeah it was it was really really meaningful um and there was not a lot of doubt that i would go do that well you did say that you were that it was important for you to create pathways for folks who don't have access who are underserved underrepresented and underestimated so how did you do that while you were at the white house yeah, well, so uh, so so some of the projects that I worked on while I was at the Department of Education was uh, did I did I talk about College Scorecard and changing graduation rates? Briefly, uh, maybe maybe explain a little bit more what the College Scorecard is and how it impacted graduation rates. Yeah. Sure. So uh, and we also worked with the Federal Student Aid Office trying to uh, there's we did a lot of really, I think, powerful work. So College Scorecard in particular, right, the idea is um, the ratings and ranking systems that exist today are based on random things like for schools are based on random things like how much money your alumni donated or new buildings as opposed to looking at metrics of access affordability and outcomes so mm -hmm. um so the idea is looking at um for example right if the, if you're choosing between uh, a community college that is five blocks from your subway stop or you got to actually transfer to make another train and it's further away from your kid's school but school a has a graduation rate of 15 percent but school b has a graduation rate of 60 percent right like it's helping you to figure out where you're going to be most successful mm -hmm. um, and that idea of of first of all right graduation rate retention rate how many people come back um uh um we talk about uh, earnings after school. So if you actually do succeed at the school and leave the school, how much money you will earn afterwards, and then also looking at uh, uh, repayment rates. So how much loans you'll have to take out in order to be able to afford it. And again, it has to do with your income bracket. A lot of people think that um, going to a public school is going to be cheaper and more affordable, and that is not necessarily the case, again, given your family's socioeconomic status. And so, um, so helping people kind of navigate what really matters and really help them surface the real questions that they should be asking. Uh, and right, will they earn enough after they leave school to be able to pay off their, uh, their student loans, for example. Um, and so, so that idea, and, and the idea is like, it's not the privileged students that have like all kinds of support and safety networks and systems in place, but it is the folks who need uh, to like the best help making some of these choices uh, who don't necessarily have access to it. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So to your point about like who these were actually serving, these were not supposed to be necessarily serving. Uh, I, it's not that we didn't serve them, but the intent as we went out and we did, we did a ton of user research, right? And so we went to a public school in Anacostia. We talked to like a charter school in the South Bronx. We, right. So looking at the folks who actually uh, were the ones that, are, we're most in need for that information uh, and figuring out how to best serve them and how to best get it into their hands. So for example, I don't know if we have questions or, but the, for example, um, one of the things that was really important for us, and again, this came from my learnings in media, which is look, if you have a television show you want people to watch, right? You wanna get it out to them whenever they're looking for it on whatever device uh, and figure that out. And then for us, that's what we, that's the approach we took around uh, around College Scorecard, which is we really, not everybody's going to come to an ed.gov website to actually look at, check out their colleges. And so how do we get the information out to where they were looking for it? We really wanted to change the conversation about what made for a good school. 
Uh, and so we created an API. We actually made the application programming interface. We made the data available because the government is notorious for, you want some data? Sure, no problem. We'll give you a PDF scan sideways um, that you can't actually do that much with. And so we actually made the data accessible. Our password for the project was set the data free. Um, and that idea of of exposing it and putting it into the hands of people who could then take that and serve their constituency and their community and their student base. Uh, and in fact, uh, now, today, I think still even, if you go to Google uh, and you do search results, you'll get an info, or like, you search for Howard, you will get a an information box that has data that comes that is pulled from College Scorecard because it turns out a lot of people use that as their primary uh, research source. So that's the idea of like really trying to like figure out what their needs are and sort. But again, that's the thing that you're supposed to do for all product development. So just bringing those same models into bear in government, putting the user first. Right now, since that, I mean. That's a phenomenal experience having that opportunity to create that type of um, of an app of of a uh, gosh my brain talk about brain you're welcome <laughs> it's but, um, so let me let me actually let me shift it how did you go from doing what you did at the Department of Education to Techwitable and what what was that path and how did that further your goal of creating pathways for folks who don't have access, uh, the underrepresented, the underserved, and the underestimated? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, for starters, by the way, I just want to circle back on the government side. One of the things that I was really proud of is at Ed, we moved from this idea of, of user-centered product development, user-centered technology, to user-centered policy and user-centered government, right? That's the concept. And this goes back to what we're talking about, like how do you, it's centering the people, uh, your users. Um, so that was, it was really, um, anyway, fantastic experience. Um, and so the idea of how do we continue to serve the underrepresented, the underestimated um, in ways that are game changing, right? Like mm -hmm. that idea of, you know, we all spend however much, whatever percentage of our lifetimes at work. And if you are in an environment that uh, where you feel uncomfortable, where you feel like you're not being treated fairly, right? In fact, it doesn't just stop at work. It bleeds into how you feel about yourself, what you think your success, how you can be successful and all that stuff. And so I think the idea of starting in the workplace and and helping folks be successful and figure out uh, what is important to them and how to actually uh, cope and maintain and 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 do things that feel good to them while being successful at work right essentially what we're trying to do is not just help with employee happiness employee engagement but also teaching the skills around communication around again handling interpersonal conflict so making you work together better as a team is going to lift the entire company up but also specifically will put you in situations where you are perceived uh, for who you are and for what you're actually um, showing up with. I'll, I'll give you one quick example that might be helpful. Um, we had somebody who who uh, called into Techwitable because uh, I'm actually looking at time. Do you, should I, should I, should we answer questions? Should I tell my story? I'm so, so far there haven't been, there've been comments in the chat, which I'll read to you after, but there have not been questions. So you can go ahead and tell your story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's things like, um, uh, we had somebody, um, write in because, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I'm trying to think about how to say this in a way. Um, we've had people call in because they're feeling uncomfortable in the workplace, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. things like, again, I hear my manager talking about me. It's the, um, <clears throat> Uh, it's, you know, we have, we have pieces of content that are things like how to respond to a backhanded compliment, right? Like, oh, you're black, but you're so articulate, right? What can you do about it, uh, in the moment that might get heard, but where you still feel safe? So that idea of, um, of helping people again, be successful, 
uh, in uh, an environment, you know, where, where things are coming at them. So, you know, I've had people um, call in because a black woman who felt like um, the organization should have taken a firmer stance on a, a, a member who who done something racist. Uh, and she was like, why is this my job to do it? But also she was pretty senior within the organization uh, and she felt like she was battling on all the fronts. Uh, and she felt like she had to look out for more junior folks who she didn't know whether they were getting promoted in the, in the, in the right time frame. But then also it turns out she had two kids and she was like, uh, and she was like, this is the world that I'm going to bring them into, right? So there was just so much stuff that was heavy on her plate. And the conversation of like, it was okay to prioritize her for a little bit, that she didn't have to be all the things to all the people. And that sometimes it actually is helpful to figure out what's important to you and make sure that you're putting yourself at the top of that list sometimes in order to be successful at work. Uh, and also to let go of the things that you can't control that aren't in your job, again, that aren't necessarily the things you're getting paid for. So the example I was going to give is somebody um, – called in because she had brought an almond milk latte into the office. One of her coworkers had a severe nut allergy, but then went on the public uh, Slack channel to accuse her of trying to kill him. Uh, and she called up, she's in tears and she's like, am I going to have to, I love my job. Am I going to have to quit my job? Uh, one, two, she's like, who does that? Who's like, she, like they're maligning my character, like kill them. What is that? Also, she was Persian. So there was levels of like, wait, are you accusing me of being a terrorist? Like it was just like level upon level upon level. Uh, and so one of the things that we did, for example, was, um, uh, she didn't feel like she was getting the support she needed from her manager or from her coworkers. Uh, or from the organization as a whole. So she, her manager, and the other person were about to meet uh, the following week. And so one of the things we did was we suggested that uh, she reach out to her manager and get um, uh, and ask him what uh, the agenda was for the meeting or what outcome he'd like to have for the meeting, partially to encourage him to set one. Uh, and then the second thing is we sent her excerpts of the uh, nonviolent communications book, just so when she was in the meeting, she would say things that might not put the other person on the defensive. So all that to say, she called us back to tell us that one, not only had the issue been resolved, but also her skip level manager was impressed with how professionally she'd handled the conversation that he actually asked her to provide to apply for a managerial role. And so like that's the idea, right? It's it's how to set our folks up to not it's it's everybody. We handle all kinds of conflict, right? But how to set folks up to be successful within their organization, within their work cultures, um, when things are things that are real are actually going on and, and how do you how do you still figure out how to move forward and, and and do the best that you can in ways that hopefully will make you successful and happy in the organization. And then flip side is again trying to fix it on the back end of the organization as well. So we actually only have one minute. There is a question in the chat. There have been uh, some comments about people thanking you, saying this was great. Um, and the question, if maybe you can answer it in 30 seconds, is um, can you talk about aging in what is commonly thought of as a young industry, media and tech, and maybe share some strategies in 30 seconds? Uh, I just, ageism, ageism is real. Uh, I just will say that it, it also gets to a point of like, I'm all like, look at all this fantastic experience I have now, but you know, they're des they, but if they can hire a 30 year old who's got five years of experience, uh, and who costs less and who is not going to be the adult in the room. Um, so, uh, so it's, it is real. Um, it is way, I also obviously don't dye my hair, so I, I look my age, um, and it is, um, it is a real issue. And I think, again, you want to go for place for, you want to go to places that will value you for who you are and what you bring. So that's the, that's the, the key thing. Also, oh, second thing is, um, it's about the boss. It's not about the job, right? So a job that's going to, a, a boss that's going to lift you up and celebrate you and knows who you are and how to communicate with you and how to engage you and promote you and lift you up. Um, that's the other thing to look for. That was great. 
Great, great, great. Wonderful um, advice. So we have come to the close of our presentation today. It is 2.01. So I am at this point going to say thank you so much, Lisa. This was wonderful. You imparted so much wisdom and great advice. And I mean, the things that you've done in the world of tech with the obstacles you faced has been phenomenal. So thank you so much. Thank you for being an inspiration and thank you for continuing to work for people who don't have access, who are underrepresented, underestimated and, and, and underserved. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is amazing. Thank and you. So at, at this time, I just wanna remind everyone that we do have one last speaker for women's History Month, and that is Dr. Tarika Barrett from Girls Who Code, and that will be tomorrow. We will have both an in-person um, room, which will be the uh, executive conference room on the fifth floor of Two Metro Tech Center, and also it will be streamed. So thank you all, and thank you for joining us, and Lisa, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.